Hello and welcome to the Monday, February 19th, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, let's start today with a couple vulnerabilities. First one is in solar winds, in particular in the access rights manager abbreviated ARM and here ARM of course is not used for the CPU architecture. There are a total of five different vulnerabilities being patched in SolarWinds ARM and three of them are rated critical. One is your classic deserialization vulnerability. Of course, that's one where there are already exploits, kind of an exploit patterns available. And then there are two directory traversal remote code execution vulnerabilities in this product. The deserialization vulnerability does require authentication. The directory traversal vulnerabilities do not require authentication to exploit the vulnerability. Oddly enough, I don't see the vulnerabilities listed in SolarWinds global security advisory page, but they are listed as part of the release notes for ARM 2023.2.3 2023.2.3 and I'll link to that in the show notes. These vulnerabilities were reported by Trend Micro's survey initiative and uh, no indication here whether or not they have already been exploited. And as of the upcoming version 123 of Google Chrome, which should show up uh, sometime in March, Google Chrome it is planning on making some changes to how course works for their browser course the cross origin resource sharing describes how javascript being loaded from one web page is able to access javascript on another web page typically there are sort of two different requests that are possible simple requests which you could create without really using any javascript these requests are allowed and do not require sort of any special headers. And then pre-flight requests, which are requests that do set special headers or do, for example, use some method other than get and post, which typically will not be sent unless the receiving server allows you to do so. The change here in Google Chrome will be that the systems in your local network will be treated differently. Until now, one of the big concerns has always been that NetHacker tricks you to go to their web page and then uses JavaScript on the web page to attack resources in your local network. If you ever played with tools like Beef, the browser exploitation framework or such, it typically implements various attacks like that. Well, as of Google Chrome 123, these requests, if they're going to the local network, will be treated as pre-flight requests, meaning they should only work eventually if a specific header is coming back from the web server, allowing these requests to proceed. Now, Google Chrome isn't just going to implement this sort of and uh, block a lot of valid applications with that, of course, that uh, don't count on these requests being blocked. Initially, as of version 123, these requests will just generate a warning telling developers, hey, you probably need to switch over here, need to make sure that these servers respond properly if in the future you want to continue uh, using this type of requests. This change is likely going to come also in Safari and in Firefox. So as a web developer, definitely something that you need to be aware of. And Group IB has a blog post with some interesting new malware specimens that they came across that they sort of consider part of the gold factory family. First of all, they're a little bit odd because they run on iOS. These malware samples are not distributed via the Apple official app store. Instead, the attacker here either uses the Apple test flight feature that allows the limited distribution of essentially test software to some users, or they are then asking the user to add a specific 
profile to basically enroll the devices into a mobile management uh, system, which can then be used uh, to deploy uh, software outside of the App Store. So there are a few sort of additional tricks that they have to play with social engineering and such in order to get the user to actually install the application. Once installed, these applications are then pretending to be banking applications that are conducting facial scans of their users in order to authenticate them to their bank. I just want to make clear that this is not at all related with Face ID. If you're using Face ID in order to log in to your bank, and I've seen banks and such that support that, your actual facial scan is not scanned by the banking application, but it's scanned by iOS itself. And also your image is not being sent to the bank, but instead your facial scan is just being used to unlock the secret that's then being used to authenticate you to the bank. The problem is that apparently in some countries, and they point out here Thailand and probably Vietnam, banks are required by regulators to actually use facial scans to authenticate users. So these users in these countries may be used to their bank's application doing the facial scans. And so they may not be alerted here that what's going on here is not great. And then of course, the attacker is able to steal the facial scan information and then presenting it to the bank in sort of a machine in the middle uh, kind of or password uh, theft uh, scenario and then of course rate the victim's account again this is not face id it appears to be limited to these specific countries where users have been conditioned to let the application scan their faces if you do want to implement uh, strong authentication in a mobile device like an iphone like android use the APIs that these devices provide to give you access to these credential stores that the user authenticates to via biometrics and do not scan biometrics directly. And actually many of these sensors and such don't even really allow you to do that. Well, uh, this is it for today. Thanks for listening. And if I missed a story or so, please let me know and talk to you again tomorrow.